You all right. Well, you got to you got to be careful because I pick up all that sound now with that new microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Bourbon Pursuit wouldn't be possible without the support of our Patreon community and with help of our following partners. For nearly a decade, Eagle Rare Bourbon has been quietly donating hundreds of thousands of dollars to worthy causes through the Eagle Rare Life Award. Read the stories from this year's nominees and vote at eaglerarelife.com. Hurry, because voting ends on December 5th, 2018. If you're looking for a new glass that complements any drinking experience, whether it's neat, on the rocks, or with a cocktail, look no further than the Duo Glass from Aged and Ore. Use code PURSUIT to get 15% off your order and free shipping at agedandore.com. That's agedandore.com. Hey everybody, and welcome back to this week's Thanksgiving episode of A Bourbon Pursuit. And so, of course, happy Thanksgiving to everybody that's out there. I know if you're like me, you're probably running around right now either going to a different state or a different city and you got to kill some time because the kids are screaming in the back or maybe you're right now you're rushing in between families to hit multiple Thanksgivings on one day and you're tuning into Bourbon Pursuit. So happy Thanksgiving to you that you're going out there and doing all that. Make sure that you go and you bring some good bottles to these family gatherings. You open them up and you share them with your family and really create some memories with those loved ones. Now, just a little bit of news. Some of the things that are happening on our side of the house, barrel picks are starting to roll in. Our new ref barrel is available for pre-sale right now. We're almost sold out. I think we have a little bit less than 20 bottles remaining out of 217 that were actually in this barrel. It's a four-year-old barrel. It was called Tasting Room Confessions. Uh, we put some stickers, uh, the images out on our social handles, so you can go and check those out. We also got notice that our Four Roses barrel has been shipped or will be shipped at the end of this month. And it's going to be a short one, but be on the lookout for that pre-sale to happen here in another week or two. And on Monday, the pre-sale finally begins for our private label Pursuit series. We hit a small little snag with the labels, but we expect those to be in hand next Friday. So expect both episodes one and episode two to start shipping out in the middle of December. Remember that pre-sale is going to be starting on Monday and the first availability for our barrel picks as well as for CNC Pursuit series are always first available to our Patreon community members. And if there's any bottles left remaining, then it becomes available for sale to the public. And in more Patreon news, the October monthly giveaway was pretty exciting. Uh, you know, we are coming on the tail end of release season here. And I got my hands on a few bottles, so I said, well, let's go ahead and pay it forward to the people that help support us. And we gave out two ounce samples of George T. Sag, William Lou Weller, and Thomas H. Handy to three lucky winners. And those have been shipped out as well. Now, this week is always our fan favorite, the Bourbon Community Roundtable. We are joined by pretty much everybody, except Fred couldn't make it this week. But this is all about news. It's about the news and current topics of what's happening. And so we touch on a few different things. We touch on distillery expansions. Heaven Hill has announced a multi $65 million expansion that's happening. And the bigger news that sort of came out was the Kentucky Owl Park uh, announcement where it had the video renderings. And if you want to see the video or you want to see some of the articles, go and read our show notes. We're going to have all the links in there for as you will. And the second segment touches on the hottest topic of what happens with barrel picks anymore nowadays. And that's all about stickers. And since this is Thanksgiving week and it's about Turkey, we had our friend David Jennings from Rare Bird 101 also join in his first time ever with the Bourbon Community Roundtable. Now, with that, enjoy this week's episode. Here's a quick message from Joe at Barrel Bourbon, and then you're going to hear Fred Minnick with Above the Char. Hi, Joe from Barrel Bourbon here. Barrel Craft Spirits is more than just bourbon. We blend rye, whiskey, rum, and our signature Infinite Barrel Project. You can find it on the shelves at your nearest retail store. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. 
It's the holidays, which means family, gift giving, food. Oh, lots of food. Football. By the way, sidebar, can we please get rid of all the penalties in football and just go back to hitting people? Okay, back to bourbon. And bourbon food pairings. I think my favorite new thing about the holidays is pairing bourbon with food. I absolutely love pairing bourbon. I love the fact a rich bourbon pairs well with a juicy ribeye and a maker's Manhattan and salmon are like a match made in heaven. And for the dessert, oh my, pumpkin pie and Michter's barrel strength or blueberry cobbler with Old Forester 1920. And the cigar pairing after the dessert, four roses, small batch of spice matching the beautiful baking spices of Rocky Patel. I just love it. And after saying all that, I think I actually gained 10 pounds. But I love this time of year and all the cheer that bourbon brings to it. Couples are now using bourbon in their advent calendars, and there are menorahs made of bourbon bottles. In our communities, you'll find bourbon holiday sweaters, bourbon Christmas trees, bourbon Christmas lights, and even reindeers with bourbon bottle antlers. It's really something. With all the bourbon themes connected to the holidays, we've essentially created our own side holiday within the holidays. You can feel the bourbon joy trickling out of the warehouses and into your homes. And if you've been a good bourbon steward, the bourbon Santa will ride his barrels to your home at exactly 2.01 a.m., you know, after the bar closed, and he'll fill your stockings with mini bottles galore and fully wrapped limited edition goodness. But if you've been a bad bourbon geek, the bourbon Santa will know, and at 2.01, he will break into your house, kick your dog, drink all your pappy, and steal your cookies. So, this bourbon season, be nice, because the bourbon Santa is always watching. And that's this week's Above the Char. Do you have a bourbon holiday decoration? Share it with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Until next week, cheers! Welcome back to the 26th recording of the Bourbon Community Roundtable. It's a crowd favorite. It's a fan favorite. We talk about new and interesting news that is happening inside the bourbon world with a lot of the elite bloggers on the scene. And, you know, we've got two of the trio from Bourbon Pursuit here tonight. So, Ryan, how are you, buddy? I am doing well. It's my favorite week of the year. Thanksgiving week, you know, just getting ready to get bloated, you know, drink a lot of bourbon and uh, enjoy some family time and friends. And so, oddly enough, we were talking before here about what do we pair with turkey? And everybody's like, oh, you got to go with Pinot. You got to go Pinot Noir. <laughs> are you going to are you gonna, are you gonna be a wine guy when it comes to turkey time this Thursday? Or are you going to sit there and uh, maybe bring us a wild turkey? You know, that's a game day decision. You know, I'm just really excited right now because it's somebody's birthday and I can't even think about anything <laughs> else. You know, just, you know, I've been so excited all day to now to talk about it tonight. Well, that's that's a good way. We'll, we'll go ahead and, and say uh, happy birthday to Carrie from the Thank round table. So congratulations to uh, 42. 42 young years. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it. And uh, I actually... Um, my night consisted of going to the cycling club or, you know, the indoor cycling bar and then ribs and then podcasts. So nice. as you guys know, you fit into like my life that I wanted on my birthday. Nothing more than to sit here and talk Very bourbon with you guys. Important. Just hanging yeah. out with a bunch of internet friends at night. That's right. <laughs> so do you have more blog posts or birthdays? Uh <laughs> Definitely birthdays, but I do like being considered an elite blogger, though. I gotta like, I'm gonna, that's my tagline. Just go ahead. Yeah. Blogger. When you make your business cards, go ahead and just put that on the back. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> but, so, uh, as usual, before we begin, we usually just go around the horn and everybody kind of talks about where they blog or what they do. So, Carrie, since we had uh, kind of introduced you and your, your, your birthday, I'm gonna let you go ahead and go first. Cool. So, I'm, uh, I'm on uh, suburbia.com, S U B O U R. I can't even pronounce it. S-U-B-O-U-R-B-I-A.com. Um, on Twitter, at bourbon underscore gamer. Um, I'm, actually, I, I'm actually about to add another person to the Suburbia team. So um, I think that'll help because you guys, I mean, Breaking Bourbon's got like 18 guys, right? So like, you know, they don't have to do uh, an unfair advantage of uh, <laughs> really do. So looking to expand, write more articles, write more reviews. I, I kind of like not the review stuff, but just kind of the funny, like, 
the stuff we can all relate to. Um, the one I'm working on now is, you know how they do the, the come on man when they're talking about sports and people mm-hmm. do stupid mm-hmm. stuff. Come so on, I'm gonna man. Bourbons. I have bourbons. Come on, man. Um, so that's the next one coming out. And uh, yeah, just find me on social media. Absolutely. And uh, our lawyer in resident, Brian, I'll let you go ahead and go next. That must be me. Thanks, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, this is Brian with Sippin' Corn. You can find me on a new website. Uh, you can find it at sippincorn.com or brianhara.com, B-R-I-A-N-H-A-A-R-A, um, or bourbonjustice.com. All three of you, all three of those will lead you to the same place, um, along with Twitter, now Instagram. Thanks, guys, and Facebook. All he has to do, he writes one book, and then all of a sudden, he's all over the digital map. <laughs> I needed it he's everywhere. It. He's everywhere I now. I mean, that's a big step. Right? Yeah. A blogger and, and a book writer. And we got to say thanks to him as well, because he was at the Louisville Bourbon Society meeting tonight, and he was there, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies and signing autographs. And he said, <laughs> guys, I, I've got to go. The roundtable starts in 10 minutes. And uh, yeah, he he booked it on out of there, and, and now we have the pleasure of having him on the podcast tonight. So, well, hopefully, we uh, have a significant uptake uptick in uh, viewers, and they're they're on the live chat saying they saw me there, and uh, can actually <laughs> measure those results. But let's just pretend <laughs> that they're all watching that. <laughs> well, we're at seventy right now, so we've we've got a we've got a great roll going on. But with that, let's go ahead and keep it going, Blake. Our our. Are you, are, you the, are you the Cal Ripken of this? Is that what she yes, said? That basically yes, you've never the, missed a, a roundtable. If you uh, if you have missed a round ca- table, you are not like me because I have never missed one. And uh, you know I'm 26 strong. Um, the most uh, let's see the most um, what do we call that tenured most no. guest appearance most tenured of the Bourbon Pursuit podcast um, mainly just because of the roundtables. But uh, no, I'm Blake from Bourboner.com, B-O-U-R-B-O-N-R, and then also Sealbox.com, S-E-E-L-B-A-C-H-S, just to plug a little bit of everything, but finding on uh, all the social actually, medias and everything. Do you actually work, Blake? I'm just yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you need your <laughs> taxes <laughs> done, go to ReberFinancial.com. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he doesn't sleep. Yeah. Just, okay. <laughs> That's the thing that actually I, I'm missing is, you know, not hobbies or jobs. It's, it's just sleep. But. <laughs> <laughs> you well, go. you got that, that starting five of kids over there. So it's, I'm sure it's keeping you. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're, we're in a two story now though. So it, it's great. Like I can just lock everybody upstairs, put the baby gates up. There'll be no more crying kids in the background. It's uh do you have Works a basement? Pretty well. No, nah, not in Florida. Uh, that's the next too, move. Too close to sea level. Yeah, well, I think we got to move further north for that. Yeah, you got to get the basement. Yeah, I wish we did. The basement's actually the greatest thing ever because it's like you store whatever you want down you there. Do whatever you want down here. Nobody can see you. <laughs> I mean, I'm, not even, I'm not even wearing pants. Yeah. And everybody's here to see me. This is amazing. <laughs> well, speaking of basements, we've got – Nick from Breaking Bourbon on here, who is just now, he's seated in his new uh, basement area that he just got done with uh, his new bourbon shelves and his barrel staves. So, Nick, welcome back to the show. I was admiring the new bar back there. Yeah, thank you. So, looks finally, great, buddy. Buddy. Yeah. thank you. Yeah, not the uh, bottles, but it looks really good. What's that? You need a couple more bottles, but it looks yeah, really kind good. Of, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a quick tour. Right. So uh, I'm Nick from BreakingBourbon.com. Um, everything on social is Breaking Bourbon. I'll throw in a quick promo. We did just kick off a t-shirt sale. So all the t-shirts in our store, uh, 15% off, use code BB15 to get that. That'll go for, for a week here. Um, but uh, yeah, so the fun stuff. So yeah, historically, I've just had all my bourbon in a coat closet upstairs. So converted a coat closet to a bourbon closet and then our, our bedroom closet and then some other closets. So been uh, working on the basement for uh, just this summer here. Got it finally done. I left the back is the only thing I did. I hired guys to do the rest, but here I'll give you a quick tour of the bourbon room area here. So sink action over there. Got to be able to wash the glasses. This back here is two barrels worth of staves and then there's lighting. And then really where the bourbon is, is in the bourbon room over there. So 
had the guys who installed that kind of really wondering where all the bourbon was going to come from and why there were so many shelves and, and <laughs> so I, I had it, you know, hidden and locked up. Too. Like I got these guys coming in the house. I got to keep the bourbon, you know, very safe. You never know, you know, so uh, just uh, happy to finally have a space that's, um, you know, more uh, conducive to, uh, I guess, hanging out than just uh, the coat closet in the kitchen, you know, kitchen table. So that's, that's awesome. why I just go to Kenny's basement. Yeah. <laughs> One question about, about the wall. Used to Kenny's basement for a long time. So I was like, you know, I'm like, I, I need a spot like that. I really just like my white blinds, you know. Um. <laughs> <laughs> There's bourbon behind there though, right, Ryan? That's right. <laughs> question about the wall. Do they have to like bend those stakes at all? Or that's just the natural curve of them and it, it, and it fits on the wall? Yeah, that's the, that's the natural curve. And uh, it actually worked out perfect. It was two staves wide. And so they were two and two. And then I cut... And I and I position them out so they alternated, and then I've got pieces of wood chunk on the ends there, so they actually stick out, and they're they're at the right you know distance out that they would be at center. So it was a bit of a challenge figuring out how to do all that. I didn't end up having to just do finishing screws. I had tried gluing them, tried different things, and they just wouldn't uh, they wouldn't stay up. So finally, I just said, okay, they're just going in with screws, and I got to get this done. So it's awesome. Hey, all real right. quick, I'm moving on to next pour. Happy 20. Oh, man. What this junk is all about. Terry, I'll grab the – isn't this one of your favorites? Is it, which uh, – Saz 18, is it tank? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's, that's my jam. Only, what year? I can't see the, the new ones. This one is uh, 2013. That's a tank. Ah, beautiful. Yep. Yeah, that's delicious. Well, cool. And then we've also got a, uh, a version of the roundtable. Somebody who hasn't been on here before. So, David Jennings of Rare Bird 101, welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Hi, hey, man. I'm David. Hey, hey. I'm with Rare Bird 101. It's a, a wild turkey enthusiast site, uh, reviews, uh, some articles, uh, timeline, all kinds of information. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Rare Bird 101. I'm on Twitter at RBird101. And uh, I apologize for my voice. I have a, a cold, but I felt like it'd be important mm -hmm. to be here. So uh, I'll uh, try to uh, to manage here. <laughs> Sounds good. Feel free, feel free to save your voice if you need to when we get to uh, to your section. <laughs> All righty. And that that hey, might Bobby. also be uh, putting the uh, putting the punchline a little bit ahead of what we're wanting to do tonight, so you kind of have an idea. But the real the, quick, what is it? Say only because it's your birthday. Uh, only because it's your birthday. <laughs> that I think if you were to ask who is the hottest uh, blogger person on Twitter when it comes to bourbon, I think uh, Rare Bird probably is. Oh man, right yeah. Are we saying? Yeah, I appreciate that, Gary. Um, like trending because I agree. I mean, you're you're hitting it out. Of the park. Oh, thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Fantastic information. I like yeah. his hair. I guess I should follow. <laughs> I guess I should follow you now. <laughs> I mean, this is. I think we had talked about already. Like we're gonna do like a bourbon studs calendar. Uh, is that what it is? <laughs> like it's <laughs> whoever wants to be Mr. March, go ahead and stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Dad Bob Thank y'all. I, I really appreciate that. Seriously, I, that that's too kind. You guys have been doing this for a long time. I've been following all y'all, and uh, it it just it really it really means a lot to me. So thank you, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Cool. All right. Well, now you're in the mix of it, so just don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So our, 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 yeah, it's all good. Our first topic tonight is we're gonna be talking about distillery expansions there seems to be a lot of money that's been floating around and we've been talking about this for a while of uh, seeing a lot of influx of capital that's being pushed everywhere and the first one we're going to talk about is heaven hill who has announced a 65 dollar million expansion to their visitor center uh this is not just their visitor center it's actually going to be i think it was uh, around 15 million that's going to be going into the uh quote unquote the bourbon heritage center but that is actually going to be rebranded we have no idea what it's going to be, but it's going to be interesting because this is one of the first stops or one of the, the places that originally had been originated as part of the Kentucky Bourbon Trail back in 2004. Uh, but other things that they had noted is that a lot of this is actually going to go into the distillery in itself and expanding to create new warehouses. Uh, it's going to actually have an updated bottling line. Um, there's other things that they had mentioned about uh, something that's going to be pretty interesting. I kind of want to get your all's thoughts on this too. It's called a You Do Bourbon Hands-On Lab where you can bottle your own bourbon. So 
don't know. Do you think it's going to be sort of like a, a maker's mark esque experience there when you get to dip your own bottle? Anybody want to kind of take it onto that of so. what you can gain from it? I think the Heritage Center might be the lamest tour <laughs> on the. I don't know. Is anybody with me? Like it, you go it's, there, it's lame. Yeah. There, there's no right. distillery. You watch a video, and then you have like this high end tasting experience. It's not that high end. I don't know. It's just they need they needed it, but I think it just you shows don't like you how sitting around the big uh big, circle. big tub. <laughs> I kind of like that it's hidden though. I never knew it was back there till I took the tour. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's pretty lame. But uh, it just shows you too that how much money these distilleries are making and sitting on, and they're just trying to spend as much as possible to save on taxes and corporate dollars. And it's like, it, it's just they're making unfathomable amount of money, and they just can't spend it fast enough. I mean, Heaven Hill's already put up what how much they spend on a new new still in Louisville, and then they put up five fifty thousand barrel warehouses, and now they're doing this. It's like holy cow, you know. But that's also a sign of the times of, of business being good. Sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I feel like well, they're all expanding. Years ago, too, with like, expansions where who was it? it? Was like Maker's Mark had a big expansion. Beam had a big expansion. Um, who else? Of course, Four, Four Roses Maybe doubled their doubled it. Four, you know, mirrored their production. Yes, yeah, so I think you know Heaven Hill just looks and sees, hey, we're kind of behind the times here, and we should be the centerpiece of all this. Um, you know, with the Maker's Mark, with dipping the wax, that's a pretty cool experience. I don't know what the experience is going to be at heaven Hill. Like they, they can't let you dump it straight from a barrel and then sell it to you. Um, you know, so I don't know. I, I'll be interested well, to they, see. How kind of it, at beam before I've done the thing where you, where they, for the knob Creek, you yeah, get the same day, yeah. you, mm-hmm. you, you dump it and bring it home. So I yeah, guess it's going to be kind of close to that. They did that. They must have like pre run those through, through right. distribution or something. Um, well, although, I mean, I guess if they're allowed a certain amount from the distillery, they can sell those. I don't there's know. No special, but, you know, Knob Creek, at least there's cool. wax on it. Is there? I think there's one thing they need to put there, and that's a roller coaster. And if they put a roller coaster, <laughs> I feel like we'll, we'll, we'll get to that with the next one, I think. We'll get yeah, to you're that getting ahead of yourself, man. Sorry. I think in all seriousness, no, where it is now is experience. So anything you can do to bring some kind of experience that's different, that's unique, that lets you feel like you're involved in the process in some way. I mean, I think that's really the name of the game because it's become a tourist destination. And so it's why would you go there? Yeah, I think you need an experience of some kind. So I think they're trying to think of different ways to bring people out, to bring an experience there that's different than what the other ones are. You know, I think the problem too is the friend, you know, friends will ask me, hey, I'm headed to the Bourbon Trail. What what places should I see? And a couple of years ago, it was pretty easy to name four or five places. Now you're getting to the point where you're going to have to make a week out of it in order to see all these places that you want to visit. Everybody's expanding. Everybody's opening up new places. And um, I don't know, at some point, I almost feel like you're going to have too many distilleries that you need to visit in a trip. Yeah. Well, I think that's kind of the goal that the Bourbon Trail wants. You know, they, you want you want to have a little bit of a, a repeatable business. Uh, you know, you, you go and I've never done it, but Ryan talks about all the time. You go to Sonoma, you go to wine country. There's no way that you can hit every single place. And so it, it gives you an opportunity to say, like, all right, well, we had a great time. We'll come back another year or two years or three years or whatever that uh, that is. And so it, it does give the, the tourism industry to be able to do that. And I also think one of the things that Ryan had brought up at the very beginning, you know, it's, it's harsh to call it lame, but it, it is one of those tours that there's there's not a whole lot of meat on the bone there. There's just not a there's not a whole lot to do except kind of go around, look at some pictures, hear some things, uh, and then you can get a tasting at the end of it. Kenny, is there is there any uh, description of this make your own bourbon type of experience? Now, from what we saw, uh, I, I didn't go to the the media event to be able to kind of get some more insider information about it, but it's going to be one thing to kind of look uh, to see what they're going to do, uh, as well as one thing that was in the press release is they're also hopping on the cocktail train. Uh, they're looking at building a rooftop bar that's going to be overlooking all the Rick houses uh, and stuff like that, too. So it seems like the, the cocktail train is something that everybody seems to be hopping on now to try and uh, gain a little bit more um, in an edge of the marketplace when it comes to that too. Yeah. I think that I'm expands like, it out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I know that there are some, uh, there's some scotch distilleries that have a, a similar type of experience where you can go and, 
and fill your own bottle and they'll even have a custom label. And I'm not as familiar with scotch as I am bourbon, but you know, I know that I've seen that before and maybe they're trying to do a similar type of experience. And uh, I could see that being a, a big draw if it was done, if it was done right. Mm. Yeah. And, and, and this is another thing people, like those makers, Mark barrel people. I'm amazed at how many people are like, I'm going down to makers to get my barrel that was, Barrel, you know, from the Ambassador Club, how people uh, talk about that stuff. <laughs> I'm like, they grabbed it from behind the counter for mine. <laughs> but people do that, so I guess the common, you know, it's for the common people. I don't know. But question for you, so, so we all kind of get the, I'm sure people asking, hey, I'm going to the distill or going to the Bourbon Trail. Which distillery should I hit? Is Heaven Hill ever in your top three of suggestions? <laughs> Honestly, when I sell people and they're staying downtown, I typically say the Evan Williams bourbon experience because it is something that's unique. It kind of wraps it all up into one. They definitely take a little bit more of like a a technology edge to it where there's there's lights and there's film and there's like, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, like hologramic figures. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, It's it's definitely different than just going and looking at another Mm -hmm. rickhouse where you get the same old 51 percent corn tour Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the and the char tour. I mean, Absolutely. I think the only t- time I send people over there is it's like you go over to Willet and then just drop by the Bourbon Heritage Center, you know, you know and it's like they're the second leading producer of bourbon, but yet we're all kind of like, yeah, tours pretty lame. Um, so I'm sure they do, they do have a tour that's like uh, kind of bottling behind the scenes. Now that's impressive, but it's kind of you have to pay for that, and it's rare to do that. But uh, that's a that's a pretty cool tour because it's you'll be amazed at the production and automation there. It's insane. But I think you have to be born in Bardstown to be able to yeah. get on that tour. Is that or, <laughs> so, <laughs> then raised in Bardstown? You know, raised in Bardstown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess the, my question is, is with all these, you know, these experiences going on, is there, I mean, do they have a real strong correlation between mm-hmm. doing that and bottle sales or is it more of just a, well, I see the other guys doing it. So I need to do it too. Or, mm-hmm just forward thinking. I think this is where it's all going. So we got to get ahead of this, you know, to be there, you know, I'd be curious if there's really any kind of correlation there um, or if it's just more of a defensive move or just a move to, to spend money. Cause you need to do something, you know, as uh, Ryan was talking yeah. about, I think about five years ago, we or not even five years ago. When did ever we, we started this three years ago, all, a lot of the distilleries went to Napa and Sonoma to like for for like a week to kind of get a feel for like what people are doing there and when you go there when you go to a winery you spend about four to six hours because you're like you do a tasting you do you know the the tour then you sit on the patio and listen to somebody play music you grab lunch and so i think they all went there and saw like hey we have an opportunity to gain people and be here for hours upon hours and let's try to do that here as well Mm mm-hmm which well, makes and, and give them some credit too. I mean, I think they probably identified what we're complaining about right now. You know, they don't have a distillery in Bardstown to take you through. They've got a room with a big circle in it, and that's about it. <laughs> yep. And so they, they had to think of something. And frankly, I'm going to go there. I mean, I want to pour my own bottle. I mean, I'll I'll do it right now. That's the, the only time you've been able to do that is on a, a bourbon affair. Uh, some of those things that they've done. Uh, you've been able to to pour your own bottle, bottle it, and bring it home that day. So this is something new, and I, I think kudos to them for realizing that what they have right now is pretty lame. Yeah, but you know they they already had they already figured out what gets people to come by there. They put out stuff in the gift shop you can't get anywhere else. You know between yeah. them and Willet. I mean, but, you, you, but you're you there for the you're, there, you're there for 15 minutes to see if the old fits 14 years there or not, and then you go to Willet and then you're out. Yeah. Um, so if they want to keep you there, like, like you the, you know, the narrative there, story. Make it a bigger. I mean, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's just keeping you there either, too. I think it's the connection with the brand. You know, what are you well, going to? What are you going to internalize, really? Yeah, and I, I do think you got to be there for a period of time. So not to say, you know, you need something that's going to keep you there in the sense of keep, get get you connected with the brand, which you're not going to get in a gift shop. You right. know, you want to feel that. So when you go home and buy something, you're now recognizing that. I can't tell you how many people I talk to that are maybe on the fringes of bourbon and they maybe only buy one thing. And it's that one thing that they had some experience with at some point. And just that's what they, that's what stuck out. And that's what they buy, that's you know, when they go to the yeah. store. I mean, especially you look at Willet, like their label is awesome. Right. And like you, you you're going to Willet, 
you're leaving with a will it you got the beautiful label on it and you can associate with it heaven hill you go there and you leave and you're like what bourbons does heaven hill even make <laughs> everything yeah i know it's true but you don't know that until you ask somebody and realize that you know like craig and all that you know and the, they got a ton of that in the gift shop yeah yeah, but th that's also the one thing that they've been trying to do a lot recently, as as Nick had kind of mentioned, is that they are having more of these rare releases or gift shop only releases to kind of make it of a destination. That's what you want to you want to go there to actually get those bottles. But yeah, they they got to do something to keep people around for more than uh, five to ten minutes to look behind the counter and say, well, all right, driving back to Louisville. Uh, yeah. So they've got to figure out some way to 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 kind of capitalize on that. And honestly. If you look at what's the one tour that everybody says that you need to go do that takes hours, that it could be an analogous to Napa, it's going to be the Buffalo Trace Hard Hat Tour. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where you, you get pretty much in-depth. You go everywhere. You see bottling lines. You see you can probably like hammer out your own bung. You can do all this kind of stuff. Uh, and so when you see something like that, I think that's probably what people should probably at least try to emulate for – uh, for a lot of this, and you could sell that for a thirty, forty dollar tour to to most people that are coming through here as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think let's go ahead and we'll we'll kind of kick it on to the next subject since we we talk about Heaven Hill a lot. But really, the big news when it comes to expansions and it comes to new things uh, and maybe even possible roller coasters in the future yes. is the <laughs> new Bourbon Park that is coming to Barsaw, Kentucky for Kentucky Owl. The Stoli Group has announced that it is going to be working with, uh, I'm going to totally butcher this, but the Shigeru Band Architects, uh, and they're designing a new distillery and tourism experience that is going to be a $150 million lakeside bourbon complex in a former quarry in Bardstown. So Stoli bought out the Kentucky Owl brand back in January 2017. And of course, uh, Dixon, who's been on the show plenty of times, is going to be the, uh, I don't know, maybe the uh, the... The, the the guy that's galloping all around in his white horse, like shaking hands with people while he's there. Uh, it's going to be interesting to kind of see. With those, how, it does appear as he'd be on a camel. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, because you say camel, because uh, if, if anybody didn't check it or look at any of the pictures, go to the Bourbon Pursuit Facebook page. And I had loaded a video that was came from Stoli of a video rendering of what the park was actually going to look like. I mean, it looks phenomenal. It looks amazing. Uh, it, there's three pyramids, there's rack houses, there's barrels that are being stored in the pyramids. Uh, there's these crazy ramps and stuff. And the whole time I, it, not only that, you, 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 well, you enter, you enter through a train station and I'm going to, plug this to you ryan because you know better than anybody else where is there a train in bardstown that where's this going to come from well there is a train that runs right through the quarry but uh this ain't gonna happen i mean because <laughs> i'm amazed when you show me the video that like hell it took bardstown like 10 years to approve cracker barrel to get in there <laughs> they didn't want a cracker barrel sign <laughs> They're, they're not going to let three pyramids in. But maybe. I don't know. I money just, talks, you, man. When you showed me the design, I was like, man, this is not getting past city council or the historical society. But maybe it will because, like you said, the money. But uh, there is a train that runs through there, and the uh, the dinner train can go through there. So it, it's pretty smart for them to integrate that if they can. Um, I'm, I hope it all happens. <laughs> Very cool. I'm just I, skeptical. I think it's a cool idea. I think the problem you're going to – I mean – you're almost turning into Disneyland, right? Like you're, you're, you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to go do something cool, you and your wife would go to the Napa, Napa, California. Now it's like everybody that I know is going to the bourbon trail and you keep building more and more attractions, get more people out there. You know, it's going to lose some of it's like some of the quality and the quaintness of going to the bourbon trail. I don't know. I mean, I, hell I'd love to ride a roller coaster, but I think it cheeses it out a little bit. Okay. So there's, if anybody doesn't know, there's not a roller coaster in the plans. Uh, it's not part of there. However, they did have a a concert venue that was going to be inside of here, uh, as well as some uh, hotels and retail and different different kinds of things. Because it's a it's a pretty sizable place from the way it looked. Uh, but when I look at this, um, and I look at the 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 type of quality that even went into making this video, I'm like, well, that was at least five hundred thousand dollars to even do this video. There's oh, no, yeah. there's no way 150 millions could be enough to yeah. do this park, uh, but I think it, it looked beautiful. It's, it's got, it's really cool. And I mean, 
Carrie, you kind of just said it yourself that everybody's got to kind of make something that wants to stick out and makes you want to be there. I think this is a, an interesting angle that people are going to want to come and see something completely off the off the rails of what you would see if you go anywhere else. Yeah, I know, but you want to see bourbon. I mean, you want to see warehouses and you want to see a distillery and a giant mash. You want to see the you want to see the old stuff, stuff, right? But I mean, how many warehouses and distilleries and stills can you see before you're like, okay, seeing one, seeing them all, and they all do the same like thing. Right. Yeah, I feel like that'll be a guarantee visit from every person who comes to comes to the Bourbon Trail because it's like, all right, we've seen all the traditional ones. You know, maybe we hit Makers and Old Forster or whoever it is. Now let's go to the Kentucky Owl one. I mean, not to say that I I love the idea, but I I love how kind of crazy it is, and I think it'll turn out really well because it'll just be the one that you know it's kind of like the can't miss on the distillery trail so i think the purists are going to hate it they are going to hate it and they're no, going to say they absolutely but will yeah, but I don't they think won't be paying the bills the yeah yeah sure, they'll, they'll be, be paying, paying the chasing. bills but they're going to be like yeah go ahead to your luxor pool party and <laughs> beatbox you know, I, I, I think they're looking for bourbon looking for like the next two to three generations of bourbon drinkers sure um, yeah they're going for a different crowd that's fair yeah yeah, yeah and I, if, if that's, that's the one that, sorry blake no, go ahead. I was just, I'm, I'm done. I was gonna say, that's the one that brings the people out to Kentucky, but then, you know, they're there and they, uh, let's go to Buffalo Trace. Let's go to Willett. You know, they still have something that Kentucky Owl doesn't have that that facility is not going to have. And they have the history there, you know, in terms of just what's there and how long it's been there and what they've been doing, you know? So I think even if people are first drawn to the Kentucky Owl, you know, facility, which I, I would definitely want to see what they're, what they're talking about there. You know, there's no reason why they're not going to, you know, check out the other ones too, and maybe learn something along the way, you know? So, Hey, it's almost great advertising and marketing for everybody else because it's going to bring them out there and bring them to start looking around to see what else they want to do. It just shows you where bourbon's going. You know, it, you talk about the oldest story. It used to be the working man's, you know, now yeah. it's just going to be like towards more geared towards a higher end, you know, consumer and a uh, higher end experience. So it just shows you kind of what you can expect for it to keep going towards. Well, it's geared towards making money instead of geared towards a passion for bourbon, but that's a whole different conversation. That's, but that's I think you, can, you can combine a lot of those yeah. things. And I, I think that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to combine a lot of those things that, um, you know, I don't know if it'd be that big, but you know, you have a, a Montgomery Gentry concert inside of here, and then you know you can go and do all um, this sort of stuff at Mont- that one time. Montgomery Gentry's Probably coming, like Alabama Shakes. <laughs> all right, Alabama Shakes. I don't know whoever. Kind of, kind of a random one. Didn't he pass away recently? I mean, <laughs> I have no idea. I don't pay that much attention to country music, but <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, I, I think they're they're trying to try to take a just a different angle. And as as Blake hinted at, they're looking for a, a, a newer consumer. And and this is one thing that Fred always mentions is how do you hit those fringe consumers? How do you hit those people that aren't us, right? Like we we live, die, and breathe bourbon. Yeah, we're already sold on it. Who are these other people? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there's a whole other whole other part of the market that they're just they're just getting their toes wet with this and they uh have an opportunity to Seek Jack Johnson at, at Kentucky Owl Park. Who knows? Like it's <laughs> or Skrillex. Yeah, yeah. or Skrillex. Kids are listening to these days. Yeah. <laughs> hey, by the way, real quick, I just want to just want to make a pitch as we're talking about Old Bourbon. This is what I moved on to. This is Ooh. 1977 Ooh. Uh, Old Dang. Weller Original. Should be. This is ridiculous. Carrie's house tonight. Yeah, yeah. this is yeah. insane. Why can't we do a live episode from <laughs> Carrie's again? So, Carrie, you prefer that to the Eagle Rare? Do you have this a- is the best thing I've ever had. Okay. Right. Ever. That's right. Ever. This well, is the best thing I've ever had. It's maybe the if things go well, then this train will actually go through Louisville all the way down to Atlanta. And we could have mm. just taken the train from Kentucky Al Park down to Atlanta. Let's bring the train down. <laughs> Come on, ride that train. <laughs> uh, but another question I kind of want to throw at you all as well is, you know, we all know the Kentucky Al brand. We know the bourbon. We know the rye. Can three hundred dollar bourbons at a very limited releases and two hundred dollar rise really sustain something like this long term, or do you think they've got to have something else in the in the hopper where they're going to come yeah. out with the next seventeen yeah. brands to be able to kind of have this bottom line? To be able well, to there's take care of that. Been, yeah, there's been filings. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Rayburn. Yeah. Well, I'll say that there, I know that there's uh, been at least one TTB filing for 
a new uh, Kentucky Owl product. Um, I don't remember the name of it right off the top of my head, but it, it, has, it has some type of historical throwback um, there. Uh, I mean, did anyone else see that, or was that just me? Yeah, or, it was yeah, – um, Oh, shoot. What was I don't remember the name of that now. I did see yeah. that. Yeah. I don't think it was age-dated or anything like that, but no. I, I think you are correct. And, and it was, so it, it shows me that they're branching out, and they're trying to, to have a, a wider product base, and I think that's smart. I mean, they're going to need to have uh, – you know, some midline products, I think. I mean, you can't just build your brand completely on high-end stuff. At least I don't right. think you can. I agree. Right. Brews and bourbon, confiscated. Uh, that sounds familiar. Yeah, confiscated. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. it. That's it. In the chat there. Thanks. Yeah, yeah they, they were really playing up like the 1869 Dixon's great, 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 great grandfather. I, don't, I forget what the story was, but yeah. Um, it's got to have a story. I mean, it's bourbon. It's got to have a story. Right. You know? <laughs> because it isn't stoly. Because and, and you know, you think about like the uh, the Buffalo Trace model. Stoly can probably push a lot of other products that aren't necessarily bourbon by having the Kentucky Owl brand. Um, right. The Halo. Build a Halo. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I, I don't know if they necessarily need that daily drinker Kentucky Owl brand, but um, which I don't think they would want to because I think that could kind of you know. Um, not dilute. cheap in the brand, but but yeah, dilute, dilute a little it. bit. Um, but they could come up with other whiskey and bourbon brands um, that would also be in the portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, y- yeah, I'm in just select. To, it, it all depends, you know. Stoli needs to sell a lot, but you know some of these other brands who, like an old Carter, who I, I believe it's only one owner. They don't have investors, as far as I know. They can make a make a living off of just two hundred to three hundred dollar bottles. Um, and people seem to be in no, no, uh, you know, but they don't have a theme buying. park, you know, yeah, they, they don't have really a, theme make park. A, lot of, a lot of money on those, or is it the really the, the quantity, like the Jim Beam that they're making all their money on? I mean, is it, I've always wondered that. How much are they going to take in on a $200 bottle if they got I fancy mean, marketing? They got to pay the artists, they got to pay the distributor. The, 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 yeah, the Beam's <laughs> making their money on white label. Right, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, on the other stuff, but the, you know that leads it. I, I think of Buffalo Trace is the best example with the antique collection. You know, I think that leads everything, and then it pull it elevates the rest of the. You learn brand. about the profile, and you learn about the company. Yeah, they they can't make that much from yeah. the antique collection. I mean, just do the math on what's there and what they make on it. It's no, not a big, I mean, big number for them. You know, jurors told me will it family states like less than ten percent of their business. You know, or not even that much. I think it said five percent, like of their whole business. He's like. This is just for, you know, that's volume or dollars, dollars, say. really oh, dollars. Yeah. Well, what makes up the majority of it then? The, the, the heavy, you know, mean, the whole Bardstown and everything yeah. else. Yeah. Johnny Drum, yeah. 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 Rowan's yeah. Creek, yeah. Uh, Willet, just regular Willet pot still is their biggest seller. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. People still wait in lines for the pot still. I like, just saw it. Um, somebody posted in the Bourbon or Facebook group. I had to delete the picture because. It was of a uh, total wine, um, same one per bottle of Willet Pot Still, and you know it's like that's that's wow. where we are. Willet Pot Still, <laughs> that's where we are. <laughs> that's where we are. Like, man. Are you gonna are we gonna start like a new segment called? You know, how low can we get this week in bourbon? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I got a lead on Weller Special Reserve. Yeah, <laughs> keep I it. Just want to drive there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's let's move on to our next segment. And our next segment is uh, one that has become pretty uh, of a recent fad. You know, we've had a few podcasts about it. Um, it's what makes people go absolutely batshit on secondary, and that's the the craze for stickers. This episode of Bourbon Pursuit is made possible through listeners like you, supported through Patreon, and with partnerships brought to you by the following. Eagle Rare Bourbon has certainly won its share of honors and awards, so now they're giving back and recognizing those who share the same passion for excellence. Like last year's Eagle Rare Life winner, Jake Clark. He's a veteran who served in the Army, Secret Service, LAPD, FBI, and the National Guard. Jake now runs a nonprofit. It's called Save a Warrior. It's dedicated to helping active duty military, veterans, first responders survive the devastating effects of post-traumatic stress. The nominees that earn the most votes will be presented to an award-winning panel of judges who will then select the grand prize winner and six $5,000 category prize winners. 
Voting ends December 5th, so head over to eaglerarelife.com and vote now. Versatility. It's what's been missing in the glass space. We've got rocks, Glencairns, Copitas, Brandy Snifters, and more to accommodate a wide range of drinks and the way we enjoy it, with or without ice. It took a Kickstarter campaign to change things up, and this is where the duo glass from Age Denor comes in. It's a 10-ounce double wall glass that eliminates the need for coasters. It's tulip-shaped that allows your sense of smell to pick up a wide array of flavors. And it has one ounce indicators, so no need for more glassware when making cocktails or pouring just the right amount of your favorite bourbon. It's also ice ball ready that comes with its own two inch ice mold that snugly fits into the glass for a slow melting experience. For a limited time, Bourbon Pursuit listeners get 15% off orders and standard free shipping at agentor.com using the code PURSUIT. So go over to agentor.com, that's aged and ore.com and get your duo glasses today has become pretty uh, of a recent fad you know we've had a few podcasts about it um it's what makes people go absolutely batshit on secondary and that's the the craze for stickers and so our friends of the show at superfly bourbon club uh they came out with a a knob creek pick uh, for their own private barrel club. However, they did something pretty unique. They looked at an old retro label of Knob Creek and printed off new stickers and actually put them on top of the new old Creek, new Knob Creek <laughs> labels. And so I guess when we look at this is, uh, you know, we want to get a, a, a time in from Brian here first of, is anything legal, legally wrong about this? About being not, able to do this at all? Not if the distiller lets you. I mean, it's it's up to them. I mean, if, if you are using their trademarked images and they let you do it, you know, you're in the clear. So, but, I, 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 but I'm really surprised that, that, that Beam's letting folks do this. I don't think I, anybody's letting anybody do yeah. anything. Because I, I think if all, I think we all can come to an agreement that, uh, the distilleries don't give a shit. Like they're selling their bur- their bourbon at the end of the day, and if we want to put a sticker on it, okay, well, cool. They don't give a shit. That means they're letting them do it. I mean, if if you're using an, a trademarked image that's owned by the brand, then it, if if the distillery doesn't say something about it, then they're giving you the license to do it. It's possible they may not even know that it happened. I feel like they know, uh, or, or somebody knows. I mean, I'm, I'm sure like Mark Brown's not checking to see if anybody's gold dip dipping, you know, in Weller Antique or something. But I think they know. Um, I actually had Wade Woodard uh, message me and said, 27 CFR 5.33 label should not obscure any markings or information required by permanently marked uh, in the bottle or by U.S. Treasury Department, i.e., it, no, the the labels aren't able to cover up any of the you know like health warning content size proof all that right. stuff hmm. if they do they're out of compliance but the trick is that's at retail so if a retail store is doing that and then selling it that could be an issue um but if it's just a private club who grabs it and you know it kind of comes down to what brian was saying with like the trademark infringement, you know, if somebody's using the trademark and um, it would be seen as profiting from it. I don't know, Brian, what's the rules on that? Is it, does it have to be seen as them profiting or it's, just as them using it? You just can't use it. I mean, at all, can't use it at all. And the, the thing about the Lanham Act and trademarks is that it requires the owners of those marks to be vigilant in, in stamping out any unauthorized use. And I that's why you see that's why you see so many lawsuits about it. Well, I mean, that's I that's that's roses. just like that's yeah. just photography trademarks in general, though. Um, you know, that's that's if you use it on your blog and you didn't get the rights to that picture, you can get in trouble for it. That's right. So I think that's that's sort of the same thing that you're alluding to. Right. I guess I'm trying to distinguish, Brian, between the two things we're talking about. So we're talking about something that's trademarked. And so I, somebody buys a bottle or a group buys bottles and they use an image that's trademarked on it. And now that gets out wherever to, for people to see it. What if it's not? What if it's not a trademark image? You're still covering all that up, doing whatever you want to it. Aren't you then just basically modifying something you already own? And 
the fact that it goes up on an illegal market and gets sold there is a right. whole other thing. I mean, is there an issue there as well or what's the distinction? I, I don't think, yeah, no, I don't think there's an issue once it gets to, I don't think secondary is the issue here. I think the issue is, is what the brand, what the distillery, what the owner lets private groups put on it. And if they let the private group toy with the trademarked images, then I think they're putting themselves at risk a little bit. Well, let's let's not talk about it just from the trademark images aspect. Let's talk about it from just covering up a label, right? Uh, yeah. And Matt Cusick in the chat actually brings up a pretty good uh, point. He goes, if you look at the Bottle and Bond Act, people were relabeling bottles of booze. And he goes, I know this is not as serious, and this is just kind of like uh, nothing to that extent. But he goes, this could possibly be a slippery slope. Mm-hmm. Here's my thing. I think that, first of all, we, we talk about legalities with labels and trademarks and stuff like that. We, we're in a hobby where we're probably pushing the boundaries of what's legal every single day in terms of sales and, and what we do. Uh, yeah. I also think that the, 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 the latest craze, honestly, right now it's all about the sticker game. And everyone's going to push the envelope and everyone's going to push harder to make their sticker even better than the club before them. And it's going to keep going until somebody, some distillery puts their foot down and says there'll be no more. You'll never get another single barrel of our yep. product put a strange sticker on it. And Someone's going to ruin it for all of us. Everyone's going to keep pushing the boundary because they want to push up the value of it on the secondary market for their own club. Period. Bottom line. Drop yep. Amen. Well, good. I think that's a, that's a good way to kind of bring in our next portion of this because <laughs> uh, one person here on the round table, they just recently experienced the same exact thing. Um, so David from Rare Bird 101 had his hundred, what, what do you call it, a century and one or one in a century. One in a century, yeah, one one in a century. century Russell's yeah. Reserve pick that he had done with uh, himself, uh, another store, as well as Eddie Russell actually picking this barrel. Uh, in you know, he had we had kind of talked about beforehand. He wanted something that was very unique, something completely different. He had worked with a few different people. The idea behind it was to be something that was special for Jimmy and Eddie for their 101 years of continued service. And a few people got their hands on these bottles and immediately flipped them for a sane amounts. But I want to hear the story directly from uh, David himself. Okay. The, the, First of all, what I did was completely outside of the sticker game. I, the, the, that word to, or those two words to me really mean nothing. I, I'm not trying to compete uh, with anyone. Um, I found out earlier this year because I had been asking Campari several times, you know, are you going to have uh, a 101st anniversary bottle? And I got a little bit of the, we don't know, we don't know. And then I finally got it. No, we're not going to. <clears throat> and so I thought, well, that's kind of sad because that's a big accomplishment and, and a one-time accomplishment. There will never be another 101, you know, anniversary, especially of this nature. Uh, and so I thought, well, someone ought to do something about this. And I thought, well, I, I, if, if I pick a barrel this year, I told myself, if I pick a barrel this year, I'm going to make the theme of it the 101st anniversary. Um, it was sincere in, in every way. Um, and so when I finally got on board for a barrel pick uh, through Lexington Beverage, Beverage Outlet in Columbia, South Carolina, um, I'd asked them if they would, wouldn't would mind me making a label that would uh, be a tribute to the 101st anniversary. And they were fine with that. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I was talking to some friends of mine and uh, Bryant uh, recommended that uh, we use a CGF uh, kind of theme. And I thought that's a great idea. That re- it's, that's a great idea. And so I came up, uh, I kind of sketched a little drawing and I put it up on my blog. It's, it's horrible, <laughs> but uh, I came up with the one in a century and I shot it to a friend of mine, Ryan, who's a graphic designer. <clears throat> and he did an excellent job making a CGF, uh, you know, style sticker. And I thought this is just beautiful because, you know, Eddie is a huge fan of, of CGF and I thought, you know what, I mean, it, it's such an iconic label and bottle. I thought this is this is it. This would be a great way to to be a tribute. And so all that was decided a while back. And I even, you know, I was careful about it because I, I wanted to make sure I, I didn't infringe on any uh, trademarks. So I didn't use the flying turkey. I used the turkey from my website. Um, and then I also made sure that uh, Eddie was on board with me having his name on the label because I did not want to do something that that you know, he did not feel comfortable with, and he was fine with that. And so uh, I decided this would be a special 
bottle for patrons uh, through my Patreon site. And then the store would have its allocation. And my Patreon kind of grew there. And so I ended up eating probably 70%, you know, or more of, of the share. And it was a, a very short barrel. It was like 102 bottles. So the store had uh, a few cases to sell. And we thought that maybe it would last a couple of days, maybe a week or two. I had no idea that it would blow up the way it did. And, and they sold out in like two or three hours. And uh, there were people that wanted them and, and they couldn't even get to their lunch break, you know. And uh, I hated it. And uh, I just hoped that it went to the right people. And I was surprised to find, kind of not surprised, but, you know, uh, someone sent me a picture. I'm not on Facebook. They sent me a picture of a, a post uh, where they were flipping it for offering it for $400. And it really kind of stunned me, especially because there was a picture of Eddie included uh, where we had gifted, you know, I'd given Eddie a bottle of it. And he had sent, you know, he had put a post up, you know, as kind of a thank you. And uh, it was very kind. And to see that included in as a sales pitch, like, you know, Eddie loves this barrel or whatever. And to be honest with you guys, the barrel is really nothing incredibly special. I mean, I picked, I picked the most unique one I had in front of me. And, uh, and that's what I went with. And uh, for someone to kind of take that and turn it into a sales pitch and, and make a lot of money off of it real quick. When there were plenty of other people that wanted it for the right reasons, it just kind of, it hurt a little bit. Um, I'm not anti-secondary. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a fool. I mean, you can see my website. There, there's plenty of vintage bottles on there. Um, I, I think that there's a healthy secondary and then there's an unhealthy secondary. And, and, and there's no way to really draw hard lines and figure out, you know, definitively what makes something good or bad secondary. It's kind of like the, uh, you know, there's a, uh, an obscenity te uh, test that's uh, you know, the Stewart obscenity test where it's basically like, I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the same thing I use on the secondary. It, you know, I know when I see a absurd, you know, offer an absurd pitch and that was absurd to me. And then there was another one that was similar price, 350 or something like that. And it was just, you know, Hey, I can't stop, but I felt like I needed to do something about it. So I put up a blog post about it and I tried to be as tasteful as I could. Um, and just letting everybody know that, that, you know, there was a meaning behind this bottle. It wasn't a, a money grab. It wasn't a sticker game. It was nothing of that sort. The store made very little off this. They priced it at retail. Um, you know, uh, it, it was all done uh, in the most sincere way. And we were, my, my, my supporters were so happy about it and it just kind of, uh, it really put a, um, and I'm, and I was sick anyway. So it's like, I'm sick. I'm getting all this, this news about this. And I'm like, Oh my God. And, uh, you know, it kind of spiraled out, but I can't do anything about the secondary other than just sit there and try to try to say my piece with it, which is please don't, please don't, you know, sell Russell's reserve single barrels or four rows of single barrels or any of these picks for hundreds of dollars. I mean, they're, 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 they're worth 50 to a hundred bucks or something at most. And uh, depending, and especially when you haven't even tasted it. I mean, the, the people flipping the stuff, no, no one's even tasted this thing, you know? So uh, anyway, uh, I just, uh, I feel strongly that uh, it's getting a little out of hand just because, People want a sticker, you know. I actually had an idea. I thought about having a bunch of these stickers printed without the barrel information on it, and just saying, "Anybody wants these stickers? Here you go. You can have them. You can have your own one in a century. You can have yeah, your own one hundred and one anniversary <laughs> so bottle. Your, Stick it on the shelf, Russells. Have it. You know, your sticker was done in a way that's respectful to the brand. I think most of the stickers nowadays don't give a shit about the brand. They just want to make Probably. more money for their group. So mm -hmm. nothing wrong with what you did, man. You made you well, made something. You. For the tell you world. what, that the, the, your your recent post in that bottle. I mean, you're it's knocking it out of the park. And well, anyone listening, it's got to right now follow Rare Bird One Hundred and One. <laughs> I mean, this this is good stuff. Uh, that's too much. I I, I really I, it I, I it got me down for a little bit there, and I just let it go because you can't control it. And I'm not like I said, I'm not anti secondary. I don't want to be a hypocrite or anything like that. But I, I do think it is ridiculous to walk into a store and buy a $60 bottle and then walk out and say, now I'm going to make $400 off this thing. It's, it's a little bit much, you know, uh, especially when no one's tasted it, you know, and, and who knows what it is. And I'll tell you guys, I mean, 
I'm sipping on this uh, this barrels and brews haters gonna hate right now. Another cool sticker, but it's good juice. I mean, I think it's better than my pick. I mean, I'm just gonna be honest with you. Um, that one's gonna go for 400 now. <laughs> <laughs> Four fifty. Uh, sorry, Justin. Oh man, but, David, uh, you yeah. just sold all yours on Craigslist, or was that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, now my that dad, uh, my Bourbon dad Community a- Roundtable uh, Buffalo <laughs> Trace, though, that's that's now something that's that I'll go. <laughs> uh, my dad had bought a few of the of the one in the century, and I, I had uh, there were a couple of people that really wanted one, and and I, I thought, well, I need to see if I can get at least one more, you know, for some of these special people. And so I asked him. I said, Hey, would you mind if I, I could buy you know one of your bottles, you know, back from you, so I could get it to someone special. And he said, "Yeah, I'll give you the family discount, uh, two hundred fifty bucks." Wise <laughs> <laughs> man, uh, it, it was all all in jest, of course. But yeah, it was a, uh, it was it was crazy. I mean, I, I thought that people would like the sticker, but I had no idea it would get that insane. So uh, now I've got patrons receiving their bottles this week, and I just hope and pray that these folks just. They, they hang on. If you want to gift it, that's fine. If you want to trade it for something equal, I mean, that, that's fine. But I hope that you open it and, and enjoy it because uh, that's what it was. It was picked for, you know, my man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is true how that's become, you, you know, Dave makes a good point of like nobody's even opened it and, or tried it, you know, right. reviews out. So we're really just trading based on a sticker alone where that's, right. that's like the collector's market of the collector's market where you're buying all these different picks just to say, hey, I got this one or that one or. Um, and, and really, and, and, and to folks out there doing this, look, it, if, if anything, please please don't throw pictures of the Master Distiller on there and, and 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 make it like it's their you know favorite or whatever you know it just uh, you know Eddie had nothing to do with that and, and and that that bottle was gifted to Eddie just out of pure appreciation for the day that we had and um, you know I really hated that it went that way and I have no ill will against these people that have posted these I just hope that they take from it and learn from it and maybe everybody else will learn a little something from it too. Um, that, that it won't go down this road again. It probably will, but you know, let, let's hope that at least some people see this a little bit differently in the future. Yeah, you sound like a like a true Christian. Like I so some of us some of us would be like, I hope he just dies in a car crash tomorrow. Well, I, I, it's not so much that as I, I see more good in this hobby than I see bad. You know, that's gruesome, right? <laughs> Yeah, I see more good in this than bad. I really do. I love, I love good. Um, so, but I think I think uh, this is kind of a, a good lesson that a lot of people can, can kind of take away from this is that we've talked about it for a while. People really get caught up in the sticker game, and and Brett Atlas had mentioned on a previous podcast. It's almost like collecting baseball cards. You, you kind of want to have all these and lined up, and you, you see them. Um, but really, you're you're not you're not buying a bottle based off the juice. You're you're buying a bottle based off the sticker, uh-huh. and it is um, it is a very harsh reality that we're all dealing with uh, to kind of see this the way that it, it goes. Because at the end of the day, that barrel that somebody chose that put an awesome sticker on was probably a barrel that somebody else passed on. <laughs> yep. and that's just yep. that's the nature of what it is. Yep, that's it's, right. That's you know, right. I got burnt out on the the limited releases, and I was like single. Book- Store picks are the new unicorns, and now I'm like, oh, now single barrels are getting ruined, and some store picks are getting ruined. You know, it's like, why do we have to taint everything? You just have to, you have to taste them, and you have to kind of know who you're buying from. Um, and I'll be honest with you guys, that that was my very first barrel pick. I mean, it's not like I'm some ace that's been going out there and picking honey barrels for ten years. You know, that's just not me. I, it yeah. was clearly he might a, be the first honest guy barrel. in bourbon. I don't know. <laughs> you know what? I do want to mention though, and, and Brian, I'd like to get your input on this. I've noticed a few. There were two or three Russell's labels, and I don't know who the group was, uh, but they had cask strength, you know, on the label, which is kind of a misnomer in a way because you know, with with American whiskey, you usually say barrel proof, and cask strength is a little bit more on the Scotch side. But but whatever. I know Makers, I think, does cask strength. Um, but what was funny is, I, I, I guess they're using that ATF ruling where you have the two-point variance. Right, but I asked right. Eddie about it because there was this rumor going around that, oh, if it's within the two points, you know, wild turkey doesn't add any water. And so I just straight up asked Eddie, and he said, it goes to 110 every time. 
So if you see any barrel picks out there that say barrel proof or cast strength, any of this kind of stuff in the Russell's Reserve, unless that barrel proof was exactly 110.0, it is not barrel proof. Please don't market it that way. And I think that's a good way to get cracked down on if you start doing stuff like that. It absolutely is. Cast strength is in a regulated term, though, is it? Well, the ATF has a ruling on it, but I think Brian probably answered that better. Oh, uh, okay. It's it's in it happens to be in Bourbon Justice. If you if you uh, there there's there's some uh, Easter eggs in the footnotes, and that's one of them. Yep, great read. I that guess another thing read. is, um, you know, everybody kind of knows that that wild turkey goes in at a at a lower proof, and so when they go to actually dump it, there is a possibility that a uh, rustle get close. Could, could be at 110 or yeah, right around there. Yeah, so mine, mine was a 111.2, which I mean, you know, it, it, it there, there was some water added, but you, you get most flavor, but that's not uncommon. There's plenty of Russell's reserve single barrels that hover just over 110. Jamie Ferris had several. I mean, it, it it's not uncommon. It's not rare. Um, and then same thing with short barrels. You know, a lot of people think short bar- barrels are super rare. How many times have you seen, this is a short barrel. This is a short barrel. You see it all the time. So, all the time. It's not as rare as people think. It just takes a little nick and you start, you have a leak, you know? Well, awesome, guys. This is a fantastic episode tonight, just talking about fun stuff about distiller expansions and stickers and uh, just random topics that are are, are in the news lately because uh, we, we all can't get enough of it. And that's why you need to subscribe to Bourboners Weekly Roundup because that's when you get even more news in your mailbox was it every monday is that usually when it comes out Some, oh no thursdays thursdays is when it comes out so i unsubscribe a, a, lot lot a lot of people must get that because the few times that i've been in that thing my blog is just like blown up i'm like dad go blake so, so you get, uh, get that bourboner bump that's how it's it it bourboner bump we built it we subscribe <laughs> that's a big deal only an NFL tight end can give you that kind of bump. You know what? <laughs> so you put in the hard work to become an NFL tight end like myself. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and we'll start closing it out. Since well, we'll start off with the uh, the NFL tight end. Yeah. So uh, former Green Bay Packers tight end Blake from Bourboner dot com. Uh, you can find me at all the social medias. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and then also sealbox.com for all your craft spirit needs. S E E L B A C H S.com. Uh, this is Carrie from suburbia. I don't know where the hell I am. I'm online. Find me. Um, I just want to say thanks again to, uh, Kenny and Ryan. You guys are awesome for doing the podcast all the time and keeping so many people up to date on bourbon stuff and uh brian you're awesome at book writing thank you for uh book writing all the time nick thank you for providing <laughs> stat charts to everybody and your site is awesome and uh rare bird you're a really nice guy it's nice to meet oh, you. thanks Kerry. happy birthday man thanks man and uh, hey blake <laughs> <laughs> somebody out <laughs> <laughs> all right uh brian go ahead go next all right, uh, this is Brian with Sipping Corn. Uh, you can find me at my new site. Uh, it's You can get me there at uh, brianhara.com, B-R-I-A-N-H-A-A-R-A. Sipping Corn, bourbon, um, bourbon Pursuit is something I've, uh, man, I've enjoyed this. I've got a link to it on my site. Uh, and then uh, Bourbon Justice is, of course, the new book. I've been tweeting and and facebooking and instagramming about it uh, kind of ad nauseum thanks for putting up with me on that and uh, enjoy it for the holiday season here it's on sale on amazon go get it guys thanks awesome nick i'm nick with breakingbourbon.com you can find us uh online and all the social media handles are all breaking bourbon uh twitter facebook instagram and, uh, you know, I just want to say th- this group here, it's kind of exciting here and everybody go through the different things that they're doing, the new things they're doing, the new things they've done. Um, you know, so I think all you probably watching know, you know, we all know each other from just doing this and meeting on the Internet. And, you know, that actually turned into getting together, you know, in Kentucky here and there. And uh, I, I guess it's just exciting to see people just kind of continuing to be as excited about all this as everybody is and it's exciting to see everybody you know doing the things and succeeding at what they're doing and it's exciting to see the crowd here you know to watch live and and throw up good comments and just be involved in all this because that's really what 
you know, that's what I like about it. So, you know, always doing these podcasts is a lot of fun. So uh, thanks, everybody. And David, you know, great uh, having you on as well. A lot of great info. I definitely read your site. So, uh, you know, a lot of great info there. um, And, uh, you know, welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. And and just to say with that, we I think we peaked at around 87 people live tonight. So that was uh, not bad. Pretty good number. Pretty good number. So, yeah. Dave, it's, go ahead. Uh, clearly, wrap it up. all the uh, uh, Louisville Bourbon Society people. Clearly, was. Right. Right. Clearly. Clearly. <laughs> five percent of them. <laughs> all right, Dave, go ahead. Okay, well, I'm David. Uh, I run RearBird101.com. It is a wild turkey enthusiast website. It's mostly reviews. I've got some other things on there, but I just want to take just a second here and tell all of my followers and supporters on Patreon, thank you very much. You make this a wonderful experience for me. You inspire me. You keep me writing. Uh, You're always sending me ideas. And uh, I really appreciate that. And uh, I hope to continue to do this for for many years to come. And I look forward to maybe a couple more picks, you know, next year. And and I'll go ahead and let everybody know. I think I mentioned it before last time I was on here. But but I I had mentioned possibly doing a book. But I, I am about halfway into a wild turkey book now. (laughs) <laughs> and I hope to have that have that out. Uh, I hope by Jimmy sixty fifth. That is my that is my goal. I would love to have it by Jimmy sixty fifth, which would be uh, next year. So uh, anyway, just a little bit of, of news there. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on, guys. That's what you get when you listen to Bird Pursuit. You get all the insider info. Uh, <laughs> and I hope that everybody who's listening and everyone in this roundtable has an amazing Thanksgiving. Drinks yeah. lots of bourbon, eats lots of turkey, and enjoys some great family time. Amen. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. And I had to make a correction because people in the chat were like, Kenny, you're wrong. It wasn't 87. It's actually 91. So we we eclipsed oh, 90 huh. people. That's so awesome. good to see that. Um, yeah. I also have to give a shout out because I was drinking some of the, I know some of you guys got it as well. Some of the the samples of the chicken cock whiskey, the double barrel bourbon aged 10 years. I don't know. I thought it was pretty good. I enjoyed wait, it. Wait, wait, You got a sample and I didn't? Weird. <laughs> weird. I know. <laughs> what the freak? Well, I've got a review I'm coming it, yeah. coming this week on that one. So um, I have just uh, cut chicken cut chicken. <laughs> <off>. <laughs> Somebody cut carry off. Did any of you have your single barrel from before? It, it's you're... his birthday. It's all right. Yeah, we'll let, let, it, go. let, let it, go. it slide this time. Cutting off chicken cock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, you know, we've also got news. We've got a lot of stuff happening on the Bourbon Pursuit side. So as David said, you know, we, we love our Patreon uh, community as well. It's great. Uh, we've got our first new ref barrel that's coming through there. We've almost sold out 200 something bottles from that. Um, Pursuit series, our private label drops next month. And I actually just got word that our four roses barrel uh, was a, was one of Ryan's favorites. It was a short one. So we were going to have some unhappy people, unfortunately, uh, that are going to be getting some uh, Four Roses bottles come probably into December. So a lot of cool things that are happening with inside of the Bourbon Pursuit Patreon community as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, finish it up for me, Ryan. Yeah. And I was going to go on the theme of Thanksgiving and gratitude. I'm extremely grateful and humbled by all of this. It truly amazes me that we get to sit around and talk about this and people listen to us and they support us. It's truly humbling and grateful. I'm so grateful that that people enjoy this because I enjoy it so much and I enjoy hanging out with you guys and uh, just love our fans, love everyone involved with it. And I just can't thank you all enough. So please take this week to enjoy everything. Life is great. It's awesome. Bourbon's awesome. Hang around people, share stuff, open the bottles up, have a great time. Love you. See you next time. If you love Eagle Rare Bourbon, then go support the causes they stand for at eaglerarelife.com. You can read hundreds of stories, just like the ones you heard today. So go and vote for the 2019 nominees that inspire you the most. Hurry, because voting ends on December 5th.